Yeah. Okay. I'm going to begin. It's five o'clock on the dot. I made it. I'm always on time. I just finished late. So um, thank you, all of you who have uh, journaled. I didn't know what I was getting into when I said, okay, here's the journal. I want you to do some reflection. And I realized that I have to read as many. And uh, as most people will, they will send it between uh, um, two to 24 hours before the next session, right? So this morning, I found myself going through, I think, uh, a brilliant number, 26 people of journal. Thank you so much. Uh, obviously, uh, there's variety in how people are receiving this. By and large, um, even though I say so myself, I think, uh, uh, thank you so much that you are receiving so much because uh, I just want to put uh, something out there on the table for you guys. So first, I'm going to address um, uh, the concerns that people had. Uh, you wanted more breakouts and conversations. Now, here's the thing. Um, the answer is yes, I do too. The thing with, a, with the online or the virtual method is that you, I asked you to commit two hours. Last time I took three. No regrets. This time I'm, I'm going to aim at, um, at being on time, but my on time is not what was advert. Actually, I had advertised, I said, look, you know what, stay flexible. Do you remember that? Those of you who saw it on the website, before you click on the register button, you'll notice that there's a little thing that says, hey, please stay flexible. I stretched it too much last time. I know that. I'm still going to stretch it. I'm going to stretch it till 7.30. And I, I respect that if you have to leave at 7, then leave at 7. I won't be offended. Now, here's the problem that you threw back at me. But I don't want to miss that last half an hour. I know, nor do I. And the thing about this subject is this. If you, if you as a group agree that you said 7 o'clock, keep it 7 o'clock, I will. But you know what's going to happen, right? I'm going to start crunching stuff. Or I will let go of the content and say, this is group work. This is what you want. If you want more conversations, then let's have them. But they will take away from content. And I'm okay with that. Question is, are you okay with it? Because when I conceived of the online course, I was very clear in my head. I said, I'm going to bombard these guys. I have only one chance. And I'm going to hit you with whatever I have because I don't know if we will meet again. I will come to that later. So, yes, we have desire, we are putting in more exciting interactive methods, and I hope you will experience it today. Uh, you want more hands on activities. Sorry. And this is what I used to tell the people who attended deep as well. You can get activities in any book. You want books? The collection in the library, in the store that we have will give you about a thousand activities. You want activities? Go there and buy the book. Much cheaper than having me run something for you. The problem is this. People have, uh, in my opinion, remember I've stayed in this field for a long time. I've seen the industry move since 89. And the problem with the industry, education as well as outdoor and adventure, is that people believe that the activity is the thing. And I'm not saying it's not. It's just that because we don't have, very often when we don't have anything more, we reach out for an activity and say, okay, let's entertain them. And I can run a whole thing on activities if you want. So here's something, a thought that was triggered by somebody who mentioned that. And I even responded saying, um, you know, if this COVID thing gets over, 
what we might like to do is to say, okay, uh, let's just go out for two days to an outdoor center and let's do just activities. Okay, so we don't know when it's going to be, but if it does happen in the next six months, then he, I'm, I'm keeping that offer open that we will arrange a two day thing and whoever wants to come can come. I know you're sitting in different parts of the country and the world and we can't all make it, but so be it. Okay, great. So that's my response to activities, but I will almost in every session introduce at least one thing that you can do virtually. Please remember this. All experiential educators across the globe are struggling with this. And, I, and the struggle is not the activity. The struggle is the history that we carry of seeing the laughter, the play, the movement, the joy, the sweat, the falling, the, you know, all that. It's trying to, it's thinking that that's what we want to bring in the virtual medium and it's not possible. So just stay with me on this. The better I get at the virtual medium, the more I will introduce into the program anyway. Okay. A uh, couple of mentions of me talking too much about myself in the first session. And I need you to know this. I went through, uh, I went through that piece again and I said, you know, I, I certainly didn't want to do that. From minute 10 to minute 27. I was talking about myself for 17 minutes. 17 minutes in two into eight, that's 16 hours. 16 into 60, 16, six and 96 in about a thousand minutes. I spoke about myself for 17 minutes and here's my argument. You committed to spending all this time with me. Many of you don't know me. And you can read about me, but not know me. But when it comes as a story from me, it makes a difference to the way you relate with who I am and what I do. It's a critical piece in education as well. Think about how much you knew about your teachers. And if you don't know anything about your teachers, why would you want to relate with them? And the point I'm making here is, please remember that as educators, we need to put ourselves out there and be vulnerable. When, when I said, you can ask me any five questions, anything could have come from there. But I had also said that I will, on, I will answer them as honestly as I can, and I did. But that is what you wanted to know about me. Your students want to know about you. They want to know what matters to you. They want to know what interests you. They want to know uh, what gives you energy and what takes away energy from you. They want to know a little of your history. They want to know about your dreams. They want to know about your vision. They want to know how they should respond and interact with you. It's a critical piece in building a connection with our audience. It will come up again when we look at group development and say, okay, what develops group? What can we do to get a group to become a community quicker. It's a critical piece. Okay. Uh, you like the interactive pieces, OneDrive versus Google Drive. <laughs> Struggle with it, guys. I know it's not, uh, OneDrive is not as kind as Google Drive, but uh, OneDrive is what I'm on and what all the data is on. I'm guessing that through Google Classroom, you you probably didn't have any trouble, correct? Could you access the files? Okay, so here's my suggestion. The first chance you get again, and you open that drive, please download everything so you have it easily accessible. Okay, cool. Uploaded material causing you a lot of stress. 
My answer is the same. The expectation is not that you read it all and come. You don't want to read anything, don't read anything. You can read that material should last you for the next five years. Okay. So here's the spirit with which I'm coming. I did not start this for you. I started it for myself. And then the question was, okay, great. Now that I have an online module ready, because a lot of my uh, friends and students have been telling me, why don't you go online? And you know, the old experiential educator and me was saying, are you crazy? I want to see people laugh. I want to be able to throw props at them and, uh, and you know, create disequilibrium in two seconds. It's incredible what that moment does. I'm not going to go online, but here we are. And I'm not doing it for you, I'm doing it for myself. So when I stretched that from two hours to two and a half hours, it's because I need to walk away from this session feeling like I've done something. Okay? Don't stress out. Whenever you're ready to take a walk, walk away. Even during the two hours, I'm okay with it. Question is, are you okay with it? And you make that choice. So I'm not going to get into this again. I'm going to try and promise 7.30 latest. Just live with it. Okay, great. Oh, I feel much better. <laughs> Are you clearer now? <laughs> okay, here we go. Today, anything you want to say? Uh, you have the freedom to cuss the hell out of me. I'm okay with it. If you want to express your displeasure, go ahead and do it. Yes, Sujanshu. So I think uh, when I was filling out the, you know, the the style inventory, you know, so... Uh, we will be coming to that later in the session. Yeah, so I'm just talking about, like, when I was thinking about it, when I was reading about it, I was thinking that, you know, I will, the, the, I did not expect the result to be what it was. And when it came out something completely different, I was like, this is going to be interesting. It's going to be an interesting session today. Pleasantly surprised or shocked? Uh, pleasantly surprised. Nice. Always yeah. a good thing to be pleasant about what you discover about yourself. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Again. Thank you so much for the journaling. Oh, I felt so rich this morning. I had to go through 26 of them, but I thoroughly enjoyed them. Uh, I'm glad so many of you are enjoying what's happening here in spite of, okay, I'm not gonna mention time again, last time, in spite of everything else. Today is a packed session. If you remember when I showed you the map, this session was the, you know, the, we were on a rail track, and in the olden days, you had this thing that way, if you wanted to move, two people on either side, they would pump this thing up and down, and then only you could move. Today is going to be that hard day, and I don't know if we're going to finish everything, but I'm going to aim at doing it. So hang in there, okay? What, we, what are we going to do today? Today's flow is three things. One is the relationship between experience and learning. The second is some learning theories and how did we arrive at the cold thing of becoming the most uh, used thing across uh, the globe in the world of experiential aid? Why is it an important uh, theory versus the others? And the third piece is the world of the educator and the elements that affect us and what are some ways that we can look at it? The third piece is a really important piece. Uh, I hope to get there, but if we don't and we're running out of time, then I will push it to the next session. Uh, great. Ready? Ta -da. Oops. Right. Checklist. You got your notepad ready. You got your water bottle ready. You've uh, you've told everybody they can disturb you if they want because this guy says it's okay. Call your cat. Call your dog. 
uh, wherever your children are, if they are at home, uh, sometimes it's best to lock them out because they need their time too. Okay, so just check and just remember whatever happens is normal. If you uh, feel stressed out sitting too long in one place, stand up and shake it out. Oh, today's message. Can you read it? No, no. Can you come closer to the camera? Yeah, I just don't have a belly, man. <laughs> Emotions okay. are gateway to learning. Okay. So, right. So, how you feel is how you're going to learn. You know what's coming next, right? Where are you? Think about where you are. How you feel is how you're going to learn. Just keep in mind all those different things. This is going to be our opening slide each time. So we are a little more aware of where we are at this moment as we begin. If there's, if there's anybody who is feeling like you're below the line about anything, feel free to bring it up right now, state it and leave it there for the group. And then we can continue. Yes, then. You have to put your mic off first. Do you? On first, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Uh, well, I'm not feeling so great because one, I have not been able to attend to the thing as much as I would have liked to. And uh, two is I am still feeling intimidated with the whole system. Uh, technology or content? Technology. technology. Oh, great. Don't worry about it. As long as you can press a few buttons. I fumbled and I, you know, I got delayed because of all these things and uh, it, it's just not me. I mean, I'm getting frustrated with it. Great. Uh, raise your hand if there's anybody in the group who feels that way with the technology. No? Okay. So here's the proposal. Can, uh, uh, can somebody reach out to uh, Zen at some point in time and walk her through... If you, if you know your Zoom, uh, walk her through uh, how to submit uh, responses to the assignment. Can somebody just take that on? Okay, Sheena, thanks so much. Sheena, Asha, both. Yeah, I can also. Then you heard that, right? Thank you. I, I know, no, I, I need the names. <laughs> okay, write it down. You got Sheena. <laughs> and you got Asha Srinivas. Asha, I love you. Uh, Shashwat, Alifia will help you out. Hey, look, this whole community to reach Thank out. Thank you so you much. Thank you, you so much. I right. really you don't need me it. anymore. <laughs> you can put your mic the on. Need also needs and you the assignment, you know, because I had to finally send it on your private the thing. And I just re and I responded. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm. Great. Wish for us. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, uh, I don't, I don't, it's not a below the line, but it is something and it's not at you, but I'm just noticing where I am with something. Um, I think in the comment or when you say deal with it, get used to it, or this is what it is, something about such comments, for me specifically, they are triggering. It's you like, know? I don't care, right? It, it, it brings in that, I, but I know you as a person. I've experienced you, so I know you, but you know, but those words are still some kind of, so it's not really something at you, but I see that if I say that, I know I've said it and I'm present here, that's all. Right. See, you see, this is the problem with the virtual medium, right? I use that so easily when we are face to face. So here's, uh, here's a quick question. Uh, give me an alternate way of saying it. Can I, can I add, I love you, but uh, bear with it. I like that. Oh, cool. That works. <laughs> okay. I can, do that. I can do that. Okay, I'll remember that. Thank you so much. Anybody else? My balloons are. Ah, bolly me, ah. We will be able to get a lot of money. Ah, no, no. 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 No, yeah. Yani Gusebina Kam Kartin. 
<laughs> so uh, what i heard you uh, when you shared about uh, this program mm-hmm. and uh, i'm seeing that you're trying to balance and uh, i see a lot of authenticity in that and trying to balance what the audience needs here and also you're very engaged and fully involved into the program so i like that aspect it's coming from your heart and it's not just a program that you want to give like a content but you are there along with the content and you're doing your best possible but at the same time i have this other part which says oh that's so narcissistic i'm just sharing what came for me thank you yeah well yes it is uh i love what i do and i'm here which is why i wear a t-shirt like this and i feel good and i prepare myself for this and i hope that it works for you too okay right uh so what is this area so uh, what we're going to be looking at is um uh, the relationship between experience and learning and many of you have come across this in different forms and uh, different words are used uh so i'm just going to quickly walk you through this uh how we feel is how we're going to respond to any learning environment when there is threat we respond in a particular way tendency is to use fight and flight methods so if um, if 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 i find a teacher threatening me with something like sheena mentioned that the words i use kind of in some ways threaten uh maybe the relationship we have then then it does something to the way any information is being received so we've got to think about what it does to people and um, so let's just look at this and what those different zones of learning are so you've got this comfort zone uh, now i i want to differentiate the words comfort and safety they are different just because you're comfortable does not mean that you have you feel safe and just because you uh, you feel safe does not mean that you're comfortable okay and what is that state of uh, uh, being in that comfort zone it's known territory you feel a degree of confidence that nothing new is going to happen most of our lives are, are is spent in this zone and we feel in control mm-hmm. every once in a while other things will happen that make us you know that change that disequilibrium so theoretically and in brain body um no learning happens here which is why i mentioned in the first session that one of the elements about uh, this methodology is that our job is to create this equilibrium for our students and that this equilibrium what it does is it takes away these elements and it introduces our first response of discomfort and as teachers you know there are times when uh, i'm sure you walked into the class and said okay to uh, turn to page 23 of your history book and the whole class goes oh you know that right encountered that or you come with all your excitement and you state something and the group goes oh not today ma'am or so whatever that's the first you know that's an unthinking response that's the first thing that people tend to do what they're saying is you're dragging me out of my comfort zone for me it took me years so uh, to recognize that wow that's a wonderful sound because if disequilibrium is the state when learning begins to happen then just by saying that one sentence i have already created it so that first circle when when you drag people out outside that comfort zone they start groaning and the groan is because of the unfamiliar environment that you're now creating and anything unfamiliar involves a degree of risk and that risk 
generates a degree of anxiety and the ten tendency is for people to run back into the comfort zone okay right now so you you've got a bunch of groaning people and they're beginning to respond so when i read some of uh, those things that you said which i addressed first thing um i was groaning and i said my god you know just a few words have created this you created some disequilibrium for me so as much as i'm doing this because i love doing it we are now party to the whole thing and i can't not listen to you when i could bring myself and this can happen in a flash and why am i doing it and i know why i'm doing it but if i can't get that across and the spirit across even through a screen then i'm going to stay in a state of disequilibrium and that may not be the best thing for you so the tendency is to return to the comfort zone but if i can wear myself through that groan zone then the fun really begins and the fun is that i i discover that wow this is not so bad i'm discovering something new okay and that's when growth or learning really begins to happen and these two areas growth and groan are critical for us when we work with our audiences and how do you know the growth zone it's like um you know that if you've seen a child learn how to walk that first day or that month when they keep trying to stand up and then they wobble and fall and they get up again and they wobble and they fall and if you remember the mood that they are in they usually cooing they are not crying they are cooing and there's something remarkable about that moment watching a child learning how to walk i remember uh oh damn i didn't know i was a, a grand uncle anyway so my grand nephew i was there in that moment when he took his first steps and when he took off he just took off he didn't know what to do there was no the brain doesn't know what stop means and if 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 you were not there he would have gone and crashed into a wall because he didn't know how to stop his muscles but he was cooing and laughing all along that i have a video recording of that and i look at that and say wow that is that growth zone and every step is is energizing and then and i don't know if they know whether they're going to fall or not but that moment is immensely exciting i'm guessing that all of us have been through these stages right we stumble we bumble along we make mistakes we take risks why because there's something exciting about that moment and that's what we call the growth zone so confidence adaptations there's a there's an intrinsic willingness it's not somebody else telling you go on okay if somebody needed to tell you to go on can you my phone yeah give me a second guys if if you needed somebody to go on just remember you know uh, if you if you've got been through that struggle what you did was this you came here and you said oops risk i don't know whether i want to take that kind of risk what do i do somebody came along and said hey it's okay go on but that the very moment you ask somebody else what do you think i should do was a, a a kind of a necessity in that moment to go back into the comfort zone and then they come along and say no don't worry i'm going to hang around here so anybody who does outdoor stuff or if you've done an adventure activity 
you'll notice that there are moments in which um, if you were, were the one who were do, was doing the activity, somebody came along and said, hey, don't worry. I'm here. The ropes are fine. All that's great. All you need to do is to make that decision. And that then supports us to stay there. You get what I'm saying? There is no value in pushing people, and this is for all you outdoor educators out there. There is no value in us pushing people beyond that growth zone because you think it is possible. Culturally, when somebody expresses anxiety and they express fear and they express you know, they don't want to do something, it's far more fruitful for us to say, okay, you can come back when you're ready, rather than push them. Because if we push them, you know what? They will do it. But you know what happens? They go here. And if we, and they might come out of it, and it's that, cultural piece, that group thing going on, where they, if you ask them, so uh, did you feel afraid? When they're done with it, they'll come to you and say, no, nah, that was easy, man. And we think we've done a great job. But please remember this. When we take the responsibility of pushing somebody beyond the growth zone because we think it's necessary, and it's and the decision comes from our anxiety about the outcome they will get no value from it they would not have learned anything next time they come to that place they will depend on somebody else to push them those of you who've done bungee jumping you go to that top Life's scary. It's the most unnatural thing to do. And then people will very often tell the instructor, I can't do it myself. You push me. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from having experienced many times somebody else pushing them from here to here. No value in it. There's greater value in somebody coming here and saying, you know what, let me, hold on. Let me just think this through. Let me work it through. I don't want to do it today. I'll come back and do it a little later. So all life is a movement from the comfort to grown through growth and up and down. We're constantly doing this. So when you encounter a student or a client who expresses fear, please don't go and give them what we call motivation and encouragement. We don't have the ability to motivate anybody else. And they might, you know what, and here's the funny thing, they might thank you for it later, don't take the credit, and please be careful that you don't think that you did a great job because what you did was take away the responsibility and the ownership from that person in that moment. Enough said. Great. So just remember, we've got to tune ourselves to be able to recognize the symptoms of grown growth and panic. There is no reason why anybody should be sent into a panic zone for whatever reason. Are we clear on this? Any questions? Yeah, a question in the chat apparently, yeah. Then how does one decide what is the fine line between the growth and panic? Oh, what's that fine line between growth and panic? At that point in time, the best thing to do is to transfer responsibility of decision making to the student. 
because you're not in a position as an educator to make that decision. You have no right whatsoever to take anybody into the panic zone. Because you know why? Because you don't know whether you can handle it. No matter how um, adept you think you are, if you're in the outdoors, you may be able to manage physical safety. You may not be able to manage emotional, social safety. Because that is happening inside that person. I hope that answers the question. Okay, any other questions? Um, Vikash, uh, sorry, Vishwas, uh, can I ask a question here? Can you? Uh, see, as uh, I'm a teacher, uh, regular schooling, so um, how does this apply to us today? Please don't put back the question to me. <laughs> no, no, this is one of the things my students have told me. They said you're in an online format, you can't afford to do this. And I agree. So I'm going to give you an answer. And it may not agree with you, but I'm going to give you an answer. Here's my answer. Almost everything that uh, happens in a school in the context of assessment is a threat. Children want to run away from it. That's there. Not only they're grown, but for a lot of children, it's panic. Uh, it's uh, really not about assessment. Uh, what I meant to say here is about this uh, word which you used called motivation. You yeah. don't have the ability to motivate anybody. Correct. Right? Correct. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we do keep coming, uh, students keep coming to us telling, uh, ma'am, you have been a motivation. I know. So what was my goal there? What well, was my goal there? Oh, you don't know? Uh, no, in a sense, in the context, see, I very well understand. I do very well understand and I do agree uh, about this thing of me taking away responsibility and ownership and Asha. leaving it to them. Asha, uh, so I do understand that. Okay, when somebody comes and tells you, uh, you motivated me. For me, this is true for me, and this is how I think and feel. First of all, I don't want to take responsibility for that. Your mic is off. I don't want to take responsibility for having motivated that person, even though they are saying that you motivated me. Correct. That's rule number one. Two, if somebody comes along and says, you motivated me, and I don't know it, then that's a good place to be in. Because you know what? Here's an experiment for you. Please consciously, consciously try to motivate somebody and see what happens. I hope your question's answered for now. Your mic is on. For now. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. That's a long journey. Um, so here's, here's the answer. When you can understand this principle, then you will be conscious of it and you will bring it into who you are in the classroom. And then if you turn out to be a motivation for somebody, so be it. It's because they chose you, not because you chose them. Okay, great. So uh, one evening I was having a chat with a friend and some conversation about uh, Diyatale Andhera. For those of you who don't understand Hindi, uh, if you notice a candle, a candle has a shadow right beneath it. Strange how a lamp, uh, something that gives light should have darkness immediately around it. And what does that mean? And uh, I don't know, I just kind of explored it. And uh, that friend is actually on the, <laughs> on the course right now. And I was exploring it and I said, wow, you know, in some ways, this is so much like those change zones that something happens and uh, the immediate response is to stay in that darkness here. That's the comfort zone. Now just map it according to what we just did. 
And everything else beyond the yellow and the gray is darkness, is unknown territory. And, you know, if, you, if we look at our lives, you suddenly realize how little we really know. Because every other minute or hour or day, something comes along and shakes our state of comfort and drags us into that groan zone and, you say, and then say, how am I going to deal with this? It's such a strange situation. You'd think that after uh, so many years of living that we'd have answers to almost everything, right? But the, but the problem is not outside. It's the way we are looking at it. So here is just indications of what happens. And this is what hap what's happening outside the comfort zone. You will be scared. You will fail. <laughs> you will learn. You will see yourself differently. So here's, here's a request. As I go through this list, if you've encountered any or all of them, please take one hand or two hands or whatever, uh, depending on uh, how much you want to celebrate that moment that you recognize. Uh, please do that so I know that uh, you're still with me. <laughs> okay. You will see yourself differently. Okay. Others will see you differently and they'll say, oh, you've changed. Your comfort zone will expand. Great. You will increase your focus and concentration when you are in the gray and the yellow areas because you intrinsically recognize that this is outside my comfort zone. It's unknown. Yeah, don't forget to celebrate, okay? You will develop new skills. When you get back into your comfort zone, you would have developed, you, you will know that, ah, now I, I think I'll be better at this. And it could be a simple act of uh, making rotis. I know that over the past six months, the rotis have gone from maps to circles. And I just find that brilliant because I'm consciously doing it. And I say, wow, this is fun. You will achieve more than before. I'm going to please see if you can recognize that moment in yourself when, you, when that's happened to you. Okay, great. So, wonderful quote from Joseph Campbell. Um, a completely unreadable book. It's not very fat. It's a completely unreadable book, but it's a fabulous book if you can stay through it. The book is called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. And what he did was... Um, study mythology, you know, the stories, Ramayana, Mahabharat, uh, Iliad, Odyssey, Greek mythology, African mythology. And he found that there was a common thread. And he called that thread the hero's journey. I wish, and those of you who have done deep will know that we cover some of this and we use it in how we can see our work and how we can design our work based on that. And the hero's journey is really, uh, think of yourself as the hero of your life. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And the things that you were most afraid to do when you managed to do them, and sometimes even when you just make the decision, you may not even do it, and you might bump your head and fail at it, but something huge happens to us when we can enter that cave. Because for a long time, we're just standing outside that cave, looking into that darkness and saying, no, I don't want to go there. But when we do enter, something completely different seems to happen. Okay. Ah. <laughs> what words describe this for you? Uh, you can put your mic off and say it. Lazy. Sorry? Lazy, irritated. Okay. Frustration. Frustration. Angry. Bored. Huh? Zoid. Zoid. Irritated. Okay. Great. State of accepting anything. 
not in a state of accepting jasmine you just stole it out of my denial yeah you know what this is the classroom <laughs> And this is how some of you responded in the last session. Speaking. <laughs> okay. I know that. So here's a relationship between uh, different methods applied in that classroom scenario. I was doing everything, most of it, in the last session. Hopefully this time it'll be different. But if I demonstrate something, you remember the, you remember that activity? Yeah. And just that one little thing. And some people pointed it out and said, oh, did you try? So some of you tried brushing differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, this is the demonstration piece. So, uh, and this can be done. Uh, very nicely when we are face to face, but uh, or in an experiment and science uh, class, Baiju's or whatever it's called. But um, uh, it's it's you know what's really happening is that the teacher is demonstrating, and you're watching. Stage three, get them to do it, whatever that is. <laughs> so in, in a classroom strategy, it would help greatly if we remembered this and to employ all these strategies. So for example, last time I told you, and then we demonstrated it, whatever it was, and then you went and did something yourself. You tried it. Maybe you wore your trousers differently maybe ate with a different hand, washed your face differently, and something different happened, that was your experience. And there's nothing I can tell you about it that will create that. The only thing that generates that kind of energy in the brain is when you try it yourself. Raise your hand if you tried it and it felt different. Cool. So, now that that's you confirming that what we talked about does happen okay now there's a direct relationship between these different methodologies and how much is learned Also remember another thing, these are different styles of learning as well. Some of you will probably be thoroughly enjoying this uh, speak and tell show, right? This, group, this Zoom classroom, some of you suffer. And there's a whole lot of people in between this continuum. And we are all learning different amounts and that's fine. So I want you to quickly use your annotation tool and put a heart on which one of these works best for you. You know the annotation tool? Where is this?
how do you do that i don't see i see all these hearts i don't know how people are doing it if you look at the if you look at the top of your screen you'll see view options uh, there is a drop down uh, uh, switch on it you click on the down arrow you would see annotate you click on annotate then there is a option called stamp you can find the heart there and then click on this space wherever you want to put that heart on the top of your screen right where you see that that green bar which says you are viewing, viewing vishwas prachare screen Yes, right yes, next yes. to okay, it there is there, there, there. yeah okay. view options down arrow click on the arrow you'll find annotate okay you can ask one of us to do it on your behalf also you know being there where do you want me to put it um you're going to put her heart there i like that <laughs> put put my heart on show oh okay devendra put my heart on question please cuz even i can't find it he mangi here thank you mm-hmm. Next time I'll start charging. But okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Where do you want me to put your heart? Ah, uh, question. Question. Okay. There goes. Okay. What does this tell us? Look at that. There are a lot of us. When we learn, we learn a particular way through the do and question. By and large, it seems. But when we go into the classroom. so here's a, uh, so i'm going to clear this when you go into the classroom what is it that you find yourself doing if you can change the color of the heart that would be great just make it blue put a blue heart where uh, what your style is in teaching and or parenting you can't change the color use another use something else then you can use a star yeah use a star Vishwas, can you repeat the second question once? Ah, uh, the second question is: When you are an educator, what do you find yourself doing? Which one of these? Oh, nice! Hey, you don't need me anymore. Go away. I I have a question. So in the Zoom format or the in online format, my answer changes, and when I was doing it in person, the answer was different. So which one should I put? When were you feeling more truthful? Uh, in the offline mode. Okay, great. Let's move on. Right. So, uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to throw a question at you. I'm going to send you a URL. It's going to come on uh, WhatsApp, and it's going to be in the chat section as well. Click on it, and there is a. Uh, okay, just hold on for a second. Pause share. Pause. Okay. We already have the URL. Yeah. Give me a sec, guys. Still working at it. Yeah. Okay, it's on your WhatsApp. 
and now I will put it on the chat. And you can use um, as many words as you want. So I think up to a max of 10, but go ahead and. Thank you. Copy the other one also. Okay, <clears throat> our last 30 seconds. I have to go back. No, I want to copy that first. So I can do that, no? How do you want the full Is it you look up to? You just keep it there and send it. Okay, so here's, uh, we've got most of it. I'm sending you another one. Okay, you ready? It's on WhatsApp and it's on the chat. Mm, can we see both? Yeah. Good. You want to save this? Did you see it? It doesn't matter. You can go back to the notification. Maybe the word should also be uh, schooling. So you can take it as either education or schooling. I know they would mean different things to different people, but feel free to. 
Vishwas, the answer changes then. I know. Go ahead and put that word. <laughs> it won't change life too much, you know, in this moment. Just give it a go. Okay. Uh, giving it another 30 seconds. Ah, uh, yeah, Vishwas. Yeah. I haven't got the second one. It's in the chat also. Uh, now it's come. Yeah. Mm. So I won't be able to finish. And and how do I get back into that? If your words that you're choosing are already there. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so you saw some of that. Um, you saw what was emerging, right? So here are some definitions of those two words. And I think um, I have to say that one of the reasons I'm in this field and doing what I'm doing is uh, that at some point in my uh, evolution and journey, I found that um, um, when I got my adventure education, I found that classrooms were uh, not the most exciting places. And I wanted to make it exciting as a teacher. So then uh, I went from my adventure background, my desire for adventure, you know, the open skies, blah, 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 the risk and all that. I went with that mindset to a school and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if your children went out on a camp? And they said, what for? They said, oh, they learned so much about life. And they turn around and say, what is it that we are doing in school? Are you telling me that our school does not offer them that opportunity. And it suddenly started to become really personal, you know. I said, wow, there's something wrong in my approach. And I think it started there. I said, what's this? Get? And, then, and then when I was in the outdoors, um, people were saying, hey, look, why don't you teach them? Why don't you teach these instructors some, uh, you know, processing? So that when they finish the rock climb or they finish the trek, they come back and uh, they can conduct a reflection session. I said, why would you want to do that? And they said, oh, because uh, it's important for them to learn about themselves and blah, blah, blah. And, I, and this is what I found, what people were saying. They were saying, the adventurers were saying, can we get some education into the outdoors? And teachers and principals were saying, can we get that sense of risk and joy and fun and laughter and movement into the classroom? So I began to see adventure and education and by and large education, when I say I'm, I'm calling it schooling, as a continuum, two ends of a continuum. And there was a lot in between. So here are, are some definitions I just chose uh, some definitions of these two words. I wonder if there's any <laughs> commonality in these two. But the word you use, used was learning. So this is what it tells me, that some kind of learning is happening in both scenarios. The only question is, what is, it, what is the desired learning outcome that we want from adventure and what's the desired outcome we want from education? And that gap lies there. Okay, so this is what some other people said. Vishwas? I yes. think somewhere I could, you know, we can describe education as adventure and adventure education. Like when I was filling out the link that you sent, uh, 
I like yeah, there were a few differences in the kind of words that were coming to my mind, but I think I could place the similar words in under both. Right. Now let's just look at what dissimilar words exist, okay? And uh, some of these I think speak a lot. That in, in adventure and in the outdoors, you have a self-evaluation method. You do an activity and whatever you do is your evaluation. And of course, there are some people who will even evaluate that. But in a schooling system, you're measured against this thing called 100. Everything seems to be measured against that. One is performance oriented. The other is success not being a fixed place. So today I climb uh, one third a mountain, tomorrow I may climb two thirds and nobody is there to tell me, ah, you passed or you failed. So for me, these two really speak. One is measure, the, the, this whole measurement. And I think somebody has asked me a question about what are some alternate uh, ways of assessment in a classroom scenario. And there's a whole story behind it because I was asked to walk away from a three day workshop with the school where I was doing something with teachers because the assessment method I shared with them on day one got them so worked up that on day two, they went to the director and said, can we please have this method? And he called me and he said, you know what? You're causing mutiny in my school. I think you should leave. And, and you know, for me, it was just, wow, it works. And it was a bunch of teachers who did that, which meant that they were also pretty unhappy about uh, this whole hundred thing. And uh, so for me, the question is this, how do we bring self-evaluation into the classroom? And how do we bring uh, performance orientation into the outdoors? Because that is also a struggle in the outdoors. I'm just leaving this thought with you that there is this continuum. We are all somewhere in between here in our attempt as teachers or outdoor educators. And it would be great if we could mix and match methodologies. Any comments, questions? Okay, uh, just get ready with your annotation tool and the heart or a star, use the star this time. Good, seems to look nice on the screen. Some, now think about where you are on this and I'm gonna describe these two styles. Some people plan their learning. So I'll give you an example and raise your hand if this is true for you. And just remember, there's no such thing as I do it sometimes and all times. We all do everything sometime or the other. Okay, so there is no, but we lean towards a particular, you know, one of these most of the time. So planned learner, a low planned learner is right here. Is a, is a person who doesn't think about what they're gonna learn at all. Let's say the scenario is you, you're coming to this workshop and uh, you hear something about experiential learning, experiential methodology, you decide to sign up and that's it. That's pretty much it. No plan at all. The high is a person who will possibly Google everything that they can on experiential learning, uh, read it, and make a list of things that they want to learn from that workshop. At the end of the workshop, if you ask them, hey, what did you learn? You went for that workshop. And they'll say, oh, well, in my list, uh, 
uh, I learned uh, this, I learned that, and there'd be, you know, it's a tick box approach. So, oh, okay. The emergent learner is a little different. Again, an emergent learner, low means you ask them at the end of it, hey, what did you learn? And they say, learn, learn what? And then you have a high emergent learner who, who will go in saying, I'm just gonna go with the flow. You remember that? Did I do that with you? No? So, yes. Past, you remember this? Yes. I Open did. to learning. Open means what? It came here and went there. Nothing happened there. So, a high emergent learner will go in with the intention of learning something, but not. And then you ask them at the end of it, uh, what did you learn? Low emergent will ask you to learn. What was there to learn? And the high emergent learner will probably give you a very different response. So here we have it. Are you guys going beyond the screen or? <laughs> Do you think you can stay in those lines? Because <laughs> I don't know where you are now. If you can stay within the arrows, oh, that's the instruction for next time. <laughs> stay within the arrows. So whoever is outside those arrows, I can't see you. Those are all divergent. Emergent, not divergent. Okay. This is, Remember, this is just to give you another perspective about how, what kind of different types of learners there are. Raise your hand if you feel you, were, you are a planned learner. And then you can discover what happens next. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, many planned learners. Are ah, you? Oh, okay. How many of you are emergent learners? Let's see what happens. If something happens, great. If nothing happens, I would have enjoyed it anyway. Okay, great. <laughs> so here's another way of looking at it. Okay. These are just words. <laughs> Enjoy them. Don't be hurt. Shows little initiative to plan or respond to and learn from new experiences. It doesn't mean you're there forever, okay? You can move from here. So the focus is all on the plan. Not necessarily on the learning. They just uh, even during the session they are ticking off stuff and saying, "Okay, done." So, the, because I've spent a lot of time in the outdoors with people like this, it's like uh, uh, we go on a trek, and we've been together many times. And one, uh, let's say once uh, somebody came along and they didn't bring a bottle of water and the next time they didn't bring it either. And then time after that, they didn't bring it at all. And then they build a reputation about this guy never brings water when somebody else has got to carry water for him. You know that child in the classroom who's always got only a broken print pencil in his pencil box? Yeah, Srishti, I can see that. <laughs> so, yep. That just comes to the classroom and says, Oh, you mean we have to write today? Oh, okay, I'll sharpen my pencil.
you know these guys characters are all from a particular movie right no star wars star wars okay that's just another way of looking at learning any questions comments <gasps> got to move uh, uh, wish i had a question not about this but about the previous topic uh, about the assessment aspect of things oh we will take uh, that in a later date uh, all right <laughs> Dude, I'm content driven today, man. <laughs> all right, all right, no problem. Okay, this is your comfortable place. You've been there before. Are we doing anything? Then you're breaking. Okay. Okay. So you got this. You know, there are times when you're like that. Have you ever been like this? Okay. Yep. Great. All right. Um, here's my question. We are at quarter past six. There's a hell of a lot to go through still. Seven thirty is inevitable. Do you want an interactive piece here, or are you okay with skipping it? The interactive piece was going to be breakout rooms. A breakout. Breakout rooms. You can, can skip it. Skip, skip it. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you want breakout rooms. Okay, sounds like you have a breakout room coming up. And the question is there, and uh, so have a conversation. Uh, give me a second. I'm just going to do that. Yeah. Uh, go get yourself a glass of water or whatever for a cup of coffee if you have to. Yeah. There it is. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to be in small groups of three. So have a nice conversation. Give me a second. About what? Yeah, it's coming up. It's coming up. Uh, I'm going to make your breakout rooms. And then, okay, here's the question. Um, and so rooms, is that all in the instructions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the instructions are there in, uh, it, they'll pop up in a second. Hmm. Okay, here's a question. Rooms one to uh, seven. The question for you is, uh, are there moments in your life when you have uh, had an opportunity but refused to act? Have you got that? Are you there? Have you lost that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, rooms one to seven, your question is, please write it down. 
Have you ever had opportunities in your life and you've re refused to act? Oh, there it is. Have you, can you see it now? Hmm. Yeah. So we change those numbers. It's one to seven. Refuse an opportunity. Why? And rooms eight to 14. The question is, have you ever chosen an opportunity? Why? Is the question clear? Okay, off you go. Open all rooms. So let's talk about the uh, opportunities refused. What invited you to refuse an opportunity? So we had an interesting discussion, Himangi and I, and uh, both of us were like two different answers, but it was majorly that both of us wanted to stay in that comfort zone. For me, it was personally doubting or in terms of my own skills or the bandwidth that I had or my interests. And for Himangi, it was more into, uh, you know, just stepping out and getting into a new area when she was very comfortable where she was. So she missed out an opportunity, but like wow, she was doing wow. very well. Mm, she was, well, she, it was just, you know, a difficult task, but just getting accustomed to technology is not something that she wanted to do in the opportunity that she missed. So she chose to just stay with uh, the excellence that she was giving and what she's giving. Am I hearing difficult task? Yeah. You okay. Okay. Anybody else? I felt it was absolutely wonderful. What was? I mean, this experience of this breakout room and the question and the discussion was simply awesome. Were you in the refusal or the acceptance uh, group? Acceptance, acceptance group. Okay. So uh, let's uh, let's quickly go through. Anybody else from uh, a refusal room? Yeah, like we four had a wonderful discussion in our breakout group. Uh, like our all opportunities, I mean the opportunities we missed were basically from professional life. And it is, I mean, particularly mine is because of the insecurities which I had. Insecurities? Yes. Okay. Well, what was your insecurity? Like I felt like I may not be competent. May not be able to do it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Any other insecure, uh, any other reasons? So if you've heard insecurities, need to stay in the comfort zone, didn't comfortable, uh, wasn't feeling comfortable doing it. What else? Too many commitments, uh, like uh, the external factors and uh, commitments in that particular time. Like you may have wanted to do, like avail that opportunity since long, but in that particular situation, it just, you don't feel that you'll be able to do 100% to it. So need to, uh, do you think you would have been able to do it if you did it? No. Why? No, like, uh, see, personally, I always prefer that uh, I'm a kind of person who would prefer giving 100% to whatever I'm doing. And uh, I think at that point of time, if I would have chosen it out of that, okay, let's, let me give it a try. I don't think I would have been able to give it i would have been juggling between two got it other okay things. great uh self is another one thing because the language we use is really important okay acceptance room why did you choose to do it uh may i so, uh, yeah Raul, go ahead okay uh, i'm sorry does anyone want to speak before uh you go on Rahul. okay uh, uh as I said, this was way back in life, I was 30 years ago, but the, the reason I did was uh, 30 years ago, I really did not uh, see it as a very big opportunity and some professional benefits, but I did it because the people around me who bestowed or who gave me that opportunity had great amount of faith in me being able to do it. Did you, uh, they gave you the faith, but were, did you feel faith? No, I mean, to be very frank, at that given point of time, the, I knew it was a very big opportunity. The only you think reason you could have done it. Yes. Okay. Great. Anybody else? Acceptance? Yeah. Uh, so, Sharon here? Yes, Sharon. 
so uh, we discussed i mean many uh, we were also discussing some of our own experiences and what came out was uh, we wanted to learn something new and you know get out of our comfort zone because at at a one point of time it was becoming a little boring and redundant nice. and we wanted to do okay. something new in our life it's and you know good. meet new people and have a little okay. adventure okay. okay each time i'm going to cut uh, cut in and uh, ask okay. you so we go to Sorry. where we want to go okay your voice was breaking couldn't hear you do you think you were capable ah <laughs> i have doubts okay i, I but you yeah. wanted to get out of your comfort zone it was boring where it was blah 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 yeah. did you think you were capable the answer i'm hearing is no cool okay so here's here's a way of looking at it and it's about language okay just a sec Okay, here we go. Two things very often decide something for us, and if this is true for us, then it's true for everybody else. The two things are capacity to act, whether I have the capacity, feel like I have the capacity, and whether I have an opportunity to act. How many of you feel like you have the capacity to do something, but an opportunity has not arisen? great okay so now let's just look at those different places on that uh, two by two let's say you have huge opportunity but you don't have capacity what do you think is going to happen you don't have the ability to act what do you think is going to happen panic stage quite right oh, so well. anxiety right will i be able to do it opportunity is there uh, sorry could i see the lower uh, uh, written thing on the lower uh, you see it's not showing on my screen are you, are you the only one or no it's not showing on our screen it's not showing no. can you guys try and put your on full screen put your screen on full screen try that no. uh, it is on full screen but it okay. is still not there okay capacity to act capacity to act we can see here vishwas if you could zoom the bottom out a little bit if can't you can see the bottom yeah, yeah. better yeah. zoom out yeah. no cannot see some still, more still can't see yes. yeah hmm. okay great hmm. look at another Thank scenario you. Hmm. Hmm. uh where you have huge capacity but no opportunity what's likely to happen Frustration, boredom. Frustration. Okay. See, we know all this. Pregnancy. We're giving you as language. So there are these places in between as well, okay, where you have some capacity, but the opportunity is still great, and uh, while it might not cause anxiety, the chances of you saying yes to something are greater. okay now eventually what we want to do is to come to that place in between that 45 degree angle between those two uh, the horizontal and the vertical and you have seen it and you have felt it you've seen it in musicians and artists and when somebody is doing the trampoline or you're seeing uh, somebody perform uh, in the olympics you know they're doing uh, gymnastics or something they just completely in it yeah And that's called a state of flow. So I'm just going to take it back a bit, so you see where we're going. Now we want to take the 45 degree angle, and that state of flow is when your opportunity or your capacity is matched with the opportunity to act. Okay. And uh, a classic example of this is when you. think about moments when you have started doing something <clears throat> and got so involved that you forgot about the rest of the world forgot about food forgot about water forgot about everything else and you had to be reminded and you said oh my god i've been at this for 8 hours <laughs> and we've seen it in our children some kids thickly involved my son used to love the lego blocks <laughs> and he could spend 
spend hour after hour after hour doing it, you'd forget everything else. And one of the things adults do very often is to say something like, okay, you've played with that enough now. It's evening, get out, go out and play. Sound familiar? <laughs> so that's an act of flow. When they are constantly learning and upgrading their ability to do something, they're building capacity, taking a risk. Building, taking a risk, building capacity to do that. So this is one way of looking at it. So control is a place where huge capacity, but you've raised that ability to take a risk and choose an opportunity that you might not have. So you might call that the grown zone. And growth is really that state of flow. More of this is available. And this, this need to be in that state of flow comes from six elements. You're getting immediate feedback. You put one block above the other and you say, ah, that, that works. You put another block, wow. That's incredible. Whatever you're doing is giving you immediate feedback about how you're doing. Intense focus. What you're doing is real here and now and that awareness is so sharp at that point in time. It's usually in a very limited stimulus field. In that, in the context I was talking to you about, it was my son building Lego blocks. And he would build them and he'd build, build a solid block, would not like some color in the middle, he'd break the whole thing, put it back together. It would go on and on and on. Such heightened awareness that you call him and he can't hear you. Or you've been called when you're doing something and you can't hear them, or you hear them, but it doesn't register that you're being invited to do something else. Causes a lot of conflict between people at home, especially. In the classroom, it'll be some kid intensely doing something or what we call dreaming, but they're intensely doing something. It's heightened awareness about something else. It may not be your subject. And then we say, so and so, can you hear me? And then they kind of come alive. Immense feeling of control. And in that time, huge degree of meaningfulness. Don't ask later, why were you putting blocks together? But in the only purpose is that purpose of putting those blocks together. How many of you felt this while doing anything? Raise your hand. I'd be curious to know a few people at least what it was. The most common one people tell me is reading a book. Yes, Risha. Uh, for me, I think you'll relate to this. It's wood carving. I've done a lot of wood carving in the last four or five years. Damn it, you're the guy. <laughs> you want me to connect? That's okay. Go ahead. And just uh, there's no the the reason for me why it's such a high flow kind of activity is that there's no undo button. So you you take something off, you can't put it back, right? You so, can only do something around it. Right. So Sometimes that makes it extremely, there's a lot of, I'm seeing all those points and there's a lot of this immediate uh, feedback, uh, intensely meaningful, which is why I'm doing it. And there's a clear goal. All of those things do check in. You know what I'm talking about, right? These six things. Right. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Out, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, there, there are two two examples here for I have and they're, 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 both, they're both stark opposites. One is, of uh, getting immersed in playing GTA on PS3 and the, the second one is uh, going out for cycling. <laughs> yeah, so, to cycling, dude. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Zareen, what was it with you? Yeah, yeah it was this, um, yeah, you know about my windmill project. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, uh, because the other guys were not designing it, I'd learned Creo and I'd learned answers and everything myself. So I spent, I think about uh, 24 hours without sleep. 
designing the machine on Creo, I had no idea how much time had gone. Right. Wonderful moments, right? Beautiful moments. Absolutely. All of these points were there in that because I didn't have lunch, dinner, breakfast, nothing. Yeah, in, in spite of that, you look the way you look. Okay, sorry. Zari yeah, and me. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. Please. As educators, parents, whoever we are, we need to be able to recognize this moment when we find it in somebody else. In corporate training, here's what I found. Um, a lot of activities when presented to a group, we will give them 45 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it is. And then we pull the plug at 30 and 45. In my life, I have not encountered a group that has ever done anything in time. And then it, it becomes just a critical analysis about failure. That doesn't make sense. Now, here's, here's another way of looking at it. I found that if I just said, okay, you know what, 30 minutes, and then I let them be, that group can go on for three hours so intensely engaged that they reach this stage of flow. And the, the satisfaction and the joy that emerges as a result of having done it in that time is incredible. But very often we take it away from them by saying, but yeah, yeah, you know what? But you were supposed to finish it in half an hour. Now a classic classroom, a regular classroom is exactly like this. If you have 40 minutes, as teachers, you will know, first five minutes go in getting their attention. The last five minutes go because they're distracted because it's recess. The first, so you've got only 30 minutes left. Of those 30 minutes, by the time you really get into the topic, it's 15 minutes. Then you have their attention and then their attention is gone over the next 10 minutes. A complete designed to fail environment. This is just me talking, okay? This is my opinion. This whole 40 minute thing is useless. When we later in the course talk about design, I hope I will be able to share with you what emerged as a result of me bullying a school and them willing to accept my approach. And how much time does it take? So it's really critical for us to understand that states of flow don't happen in five and 10 minutes. It's, it's a bell curve. It takes time. And when they reach that, and it takes time for them to get out of it as well. We've got this 40 minute stop gap thing. Okay. You want to read more wonderful work done by Mihai Chiksen Mihai. That's how it's pronounced, by the way. Okay, another way of looking at it in the context of adventure and outdoors, outdoor activities. This is by Simon Priest and Mike Gass. They use different words, competence and risk. Same story. You create opportunity, but you don't build capacity. They are bound to encounter disaster. Typical example of devastation and disaster would be um, uh, giving a group 30 minutes to plan a day long trek. That's what you're going to get because they're not going to be able to be ready for it. They just don't have the competence to recognize what might be the most important things and prepare for it. On the other hand, I wonder, I know I've met a lot of people who've been at the same job for 40 years and they're bored to death. Yeah. So what's going on with them? And they will tell, if you ask them, they'll say, I love it. And what they love is that sense of mastery that they've acquired over doing the same thing again and again. So it's not a, always a border place of boredom. It's a place of exploration and experimentation. Accounting is one of those, I mean, how much creativity can you employ in accounting? But a lot of those people just get better and better at it. They can look at, a, uh, 
you know, balance sheet and give you the history of the organization. So just examples of that. And what we want to achieve is that whole balance between competence and risk. This is, this is another way of looking at it. Competence, challenge. And described very nicely what a learner can currently achieve independently. Built a degree of mastery, doesn't need anybody, can do it independently. What the learner can't currently achieve even with guidance. You know what? A lot of the way we relate with our children is around this place. We get them, we want them to do something phenomenal. And the only encouragement we offer is don't worry, you can do it, do it. Haven't you heard that before? As parents, I know we kind of do it constantly, man. The reason that that kid doesn't want to do it when they grow up is this, that the emotions that were felt in their childhood when they could not achieve something and the fear of uh, disapproval from peer group and, and adults was so great that they did it anyway. But when they became adults, they just gave it as quickly as they gave it up as quickly as they could. A classic example is Olympic gymnastics. There's this wonderful, uh, uh, I think it's on, uh, it's on Netflix. It's a documentary on uh, world gym, uh, you know, Olympic gymnastics and about how the entire training is based on torture and control. And as soon as they could give it up, they gave it up. I know of somebody who was pushed into swimming, got a lot of awards, national award, went abroad, or, you know, tried for the Olympics, blah, blah, blah. Seen her grow up since she was a kid. When she came to college and you had a chat with her and she said, as soon as I can give up this, I'm going to give it up. And she did. And that's tragic because uh, somewhere we took away the joy of mastery. They became damn good at it. But the joy of it was not there anymore. So just something to consider. Okay, so here's what we can do. Here's a strategy for the classroom. Build competence first then create opportunity or challenge. Build greater competence, then increase challenge. So what you want to be doing as you go along this is to build those blocks along the competency level before you create the challenge. We usually work the other way around. We offer the challenge and, and hope that they build competency. Is this making sense? Okay, so next time you catch yourself telling somebody, especially your children, that yeah, you can do it, the reason you're saying this is you don't believe that they have the competency to do it. Or you have not built competency. And the only thing we use at that point in time is this false encouragement that we offer. Just be a little mindful of that next time you're doing something like that. So he calls this scaffolding. So let's scaffold. Some of this will come alive when we do the reflection piece about how to ask questions. Even questions are scaffolded. And when I, and I try and 
not try, I think it just comes to me now, uh, is when I'm reflecting with you and I'm asking you questions, you might want to pay attention to whether I'm scaffolding or not. It's one small, short, sharp question after the other, and it's built slowly so that you can rise to the challenge of that question. And when you can't, then I will let it go. Uh, so, Vishwas, I think you'll have to uh, zoom out your screen a bit. Uh, it's not clear, like a lot of content is getting lost. Okay, I think we have a little trouble with that. Oh, what is it you would like to know? The top? Yeah. Okay, so, the top says uh, ability to what the learner can't currently achieve with even with guidance. Okay. Why did that happen? It was fine before. Like just two minutes, two seconds ago, it was fine. Yeah, now, now it's fine. Now it's good. Okay. Good. Oh. Okay. And he calls that zone of proximal. Del so here's the thing. Uh, very often, we think we are alone in our learning environment. And asking a question to the teacher is not a good thing because it shows up in the environment, in that, you know, a simple threat. Here's a threat that if I ask a question to my teacher, it's an indication that I don't know and don't understand. Which is where the safe environment piece comes in. How do we create a safe environment? And scaffolding is a wonderful way of doing it. Ask one question at a time, because as an educator, it gives us an indication as to where that child is as well. Remember, this is about them. This is not about us. It's not about us trying to push our desire to get them to know more. It's about getting them to understand what they need to know over a period of time from where they are, starting from where they are, not from where I am as an educator. So what is the zone of proximal development? That is remembering that we are not the only teachers. That there are other people within that circle and that environment that also know how to do it. Mm. So I used it today, do you remember when? With Zen, with Zen. Absolutely right. That I don't have to be the only one giving the information. When she wanted a little help, all we have to do is reach out and say, hey, who's around me? So what the learner can currently achieve with guidance from the more knowledgeable other. And we've got more MKOs all around us. So, so also building an environment in that classroom where people know, know that they can reach out to their neighbor or whoever else who might know. So in some ways as educators, it takes that, that uh, burden of being the only answering machine to that group. So here's what happened with the other group that I'm uh, doing an online class with. One of them said, hey, you know what? There's so much going on in this class that I need, I need to have conversations with people who's willing to form a group, a study group. And they formed their own study group now. So here's the proposal. I'm not the only one. There's a whole bunch of people in this group who have varying uh, degrees of knowledge and experience in the field. Form study groups. If you can and if you're willing, depending on what background you come from and what kind of conversations you want to have. The Google Classroom allows you to do that. We've all got access to Zoom. See if you'd like to do that. Okay? Great. Poof. You still there? <laughs> oh, half an hour. Okay, I'm going to just run you through this. And this is how this whole uh, 
this world of experiential ed began, okay? It began years ago, really, uh, a few, a couple of hundred years ago, recorded instances of people talk. They didn't call it experiential learning. They just said, wow, you know what? When we do certain things, people seem to learn much faster. And here's what they said. They said, when we do certain things, people seem to learn faster. Wow, great. So here's an introduction to some to, uh, experiential learning cycles. These are just models that break down the process of experiential learning into theoretical stages. So somebody sat down and said, ah, if that's true, let's just, so what they did was give people big experiences. So those of you from the outdoor world will know organizations called Outward Bound. Or all the camping that we do in the world is about this. Let's give them big experiences. What for? And we know that if you have a good experience on a mountain, you'll go again. If you have a bad experience, the first uh, next time you see a mountain and somebody proposes it, you'll say, nay, I don't want to do that, man. Last time I had a very near-death experience. Can you catch yourself saying something like that about something? Zen? Yeah. Technology. Right? And that, so these experiences have a result on future experiences. And it's our responsibility to structure and organize those experiences so that it invites our children and our students into a space where they want to experience it again. That's what we do as educators. So scaffolding is a wonderful strategy to practice that. Okay. So they said, let's give people big experiences. Why? Because something happens to them. My, my career started by taking those length graders into the mountains for seven days. Something happened to them. I had no idea what happened. So a carpenter becomes a carpenter because his father was a carpenter. He does it by doing. He does it by cutting himself, by bleeding, by hammering his thumb <laughs> instead of a nail. Yeah, the experience is the teacher. I mean, why does the carpenter father need to tell the son, son, hit the head of the nail, not your finger. The experience is the teacher. They called it, let the mountains speak for themselves. I don't know if any of you have heard this adage. So this is the one stage model. Just give people big experiences and something will happen. Tragically, a lot of the outdoor industry in this country is still there. Vishwas, what is the difference between this model and activity-based learning then? Ah, we're coming to it. Here we go. Then they said, hey, you know what? Maybe the mountain doesn't teach everybody. Maybe not everybody learns from the mountain. Maybe we should do, uh, we should do a little chat, you know, just, just ask them one question. What was it like? And then people go into a reflect and they call that reflection. So, so another way of looking at this is called the action reflection model. And they said, after we go, do the big experience, Let's just spend some time talking about it. So the experience in some ways gets articulated in the brain as words. Okay. Activity based learning. This is supposed to be it. So the problem is this. 
that you can do an activity and you can reflect upon it, but it may not necessarily affect future experiences. So they said, ah, but what's the value of this if we do this reflection and nothing happens or we don't take it into our future? So they said, okay, how do we take it into our future? And this was called the let's speak for the mountains model, action reflection. They said, okay, let's move on then. Maybe if we create an opportunity for them to plan or apply what they've learned through the reflection, it might help. Now, a lot of activity-based learning remains here. What most people understand as activity-based learning is this, that I ask them, do you do an activity? They say, yes. Said, and then what do you do? Oh, we reflect. Said, great. And then what do you do? I don't know, is there anything else? So here's the other else. And the plan or apply is a process of wanting to build connections. Okay, so classic example is um, how do you teach, <laughs> no, maybe that's not the word. How do you get a child to learn about what happens if they touch a flame or a hot object? Then they actually do it. How much ever you say no, they'll actually go ahead and do it once to experiment. If they don't do it, they will do it. What's an alternate way? Let them do it. Let him see what happens to others. Oh, so you get somebody else to be the <laughs> guinea pig. <person. laughs> Let them experience themselves. All right. Okay. So I'm going to leave this to you because I really want you to struggle with this because the problem uh, that emerges from this is act I'm going to talk about it. So here's the third stage. Okay. Action, reflection, and a plan. Then Kolb comes around and he says, hey, you know what? This plan and apply probably has two, uh, two stages. And the other is the abstract concept. So the abstract concept in that experiment is that if you touch a flame, you will get burnt. That's the abstract concept. And that's the, the entire content of schooling is an abstract concept. My favorite example is Newton's law. How do you, I mean, how is Newton's law taught? From a textbook. Yeah. What did he say? Zareer, please help us out with that. Which one? Which law you want? The first, second or third? Whichever Everyone... you say, I will have the same story. Okay. Everybody... We all have checked. Okay. Everybody stays in a state of uh, rest or uniform motion until and unless acted upon by an external force. Right? Now, so crazy, man. And then you're supposed to mug it up. Yeah, that's the sad part. Right. Now, here's the thing. It's an abstract concept. It has no meaning. So most schooling is here. There is no reflection about it. There is no concrete experience around it. And there is no, there are no connections made to anything else. But if we introduce the abstract concept and create an experiment where they can actively practice it, give me an example of proving uh, that law. You've all been to school. You've all done Newton's uh, law that Zari stated. No, Zari, you keep quiet now. Why? Yeah. Hey, chupre. <laughs> Science teacher. Sleep. Come on. So with kids, right? If there is like, for example, if there's a car 
um, and it's like an object. It stays there until you actually push it. It just stays there. So you just you can show it, you know, in that manner. Okay. So here's the so, thing. So uh, another. Hold hold hold. hold. You get one kid to push it. Yeah. Will it move? Um, no, I mean the small toy cars, not the big oh, cars. Oh, ah. get real. Why not take a big car? One kid cannot move a big car. Good. What will you do next? <laughs> I'm scaffolding. Okay. Um, you get. I mean, I would find a simpler example, but if you want to use a big car, you get many kids to do it. Hey, my many job is to make your life more difficult, remember? Yeah, okay, no. yeah. So, Go it would on. get many people to move it. Yeah, or so push now, it, track on it. Here's the thing scaffold it even for the children and the experiment. You get one kid to push it, doesn't move. You get two, doesn't move. Yeah. If you get five, it begins to move. Zareer, restate the law now. Again? Yes, please. You actually want me to say something? No. <laughs> I get no Everybody stays in a state of rest or of uniform motion until and unless acted upon by an external force. Right. Now, what happened? So now here's a question to the children. When five children are able to push it, what did they discover? Unless acted upon? By an external force. By an external force. Equal to or greater than? Greater than. There you go. Now that abstract concept because becomes real because if you if you are teaching one kid and that kid goes there and says, I'm pushing the car but nothing is happening, it still remains an abstract concept. Yeah, true. Okay? Typical classroom example. Next session, I'm going to talk about a story where I did an outdoor activity and they took it back and did vectors in the classroom. And I didn't do it for them. They did it, which was incredible. Okay, so here we go. So this is what Kolb says, okay, that these are the four stages. Now, the problem is this. I want to describe it very quickly that um, we think that everything must start at 12 o'clock. You get what I'm saying? What's at 12 o'clock? Concrete experience. Right. And I'm saying, no, it doesn't. It can start with reflective observation. Mm -hmm. Example, same car, same children. And you ask them a question. What do you think you need to do in order to get that car to move? And that's a reflective observation question. And they start thinking about it and they'll come up with answers. Then you get them to do it. Mm. Active experimentation. Then they find it moves. That's the concrete. They've had a concrete experience. You can actually get children without taking Newton's name at all to to create that law. It just won't be as smart and un understandable as what people think Newton said. It doesn't matter, but they've understood the concept. And that's the whole point here, that using the Kolb cycle, you can choose to start anywhere and move around within those four spaces. Now, here's the difference between Act, what was that? Activity based? No, somebody said, what is? Activity. So my question is answered. I was only when it, when it was this one cycle, one stage model is when my question was. Now it's different. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here I want, I just want to expand that. People will often use two uh, ways of describing this whole field, experiential learning and experiential education. Mm -hmm. Experiential learning is these two. Experiential education is when we go through the entire cycle. Okay? Great. 
Can you please, these are alternate words. Now I want you to get out your uh, assessment, your learning styles inventory. And I have to finish it in 10 minutes. <gasps> Damn it. Are you okay with that? <laughs> now this is what I want you to do. Annotate. Put your rectangle in whichever um, quadrant you are. Use the annotation tool and use don't use the uh, filled in square rectangle, use the outline rectangle. Yeah, that like that, perfect. And you are either a rectangle or a square, okay? So uh, it, there's a difference. Do we put a name on it or just mark it? You can decide. Zen, did you get it? Anybody needs help, just ask. There are lots of MKOs here. What is MKO? This is your test, by the way. Most knowledgeable other. others. More knowledgeable others. Yay. How do I get a square here? So go to uh, choose draw. Okay. And you see nine icons there on the top row. Click choose the third one, which is like an outlined rectangle. Oh, oh. Be able to see it, yeah? Because I, I missed one part, like why we have to draw this square. Can you please explain again? Like I couldn't hear at the time. I'm not getting it from you. Oh, you don't need me. There are lots of MKOs here. Somebody respond to him. Yeah. So please, anybody? Bharat, when you did the learning style inventory, there was this grid that you had to fill. And your y-axis and your x-axis. X-axis is you minus your reflective observation from your active experimentation. The y-axis was concrete and abstract. You minus your abstract from your concrete. Whatever value you get when you fill it on this uh, grid, you will get your rectangle. So question number one, Bharat, did you do it? Did you do the inventory? No. Then it doesn't matter. Enjoy. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Question from the inventory is why does it have to be a rectangle? Why can't I make it a square? Oh, it, it, I didn't say that. I said you can be no, a no, sorry. I'm sorry. Why, why not a triangle? Like when I was filling it there, that's the question that popped up. That why a rectangle? Why not a triangle? Because the rectangle uses a different uh, surface area. And the surface area is more indicative than the triangle. Okay. Okay, let's look at this now. Where do we find most people? Accommodators. Right? Okay. This is, okay, here's, uh, I've given you a lot of material on that, so I'm just going to give you the snippets at this point in time. Hmm? Okay, um, one, this, your fate is not sealed, it's not written, you can change this. Okay, and you can change it by practicing other styles. So if you are an accommodator, uh, I was an, I'm just going to tell you from my experience and my story. I was a huge, big, okay, uh, Let's go. I'm just going to go back. Control Z. The larger your rectangle or square, the more set you are in that style of learning. You will tend to choose that method of learning more often than others. 
we all have the ability to learn in all four styles. The more you choose a particular style, the larger your rectangle is likely to get because you don't try the others. So those of you who don't like the written word will continue not to like the written word till you can pick up a book and suffer the first few times. I suffered hell of a lot. And this is what I discovered. Somebody asked me a, a, a question that I could not answer in my early years of outdoor ed. And I said, wow, I couldn't answer that question. I have no idea why I'm asking people to do activities. I just did it because it was fun and they enjoyed it. But somebody said, yeah, uh, the assimilator will ask you, well, what's the point in jumping around so much? Why? I mean, it's all there in the book. And I couldn't answer it. And I had to go to the book. So when I went to the book, I found that I found it difficult to read too much. So the alternate was read a little, make notes, and practice as soon as possible or apply as soon as possible. So instead of trying mega bits of information, just do it in little bits. That's just an example of how I moved from being an accommodator. And I, it seems like I'm shifting because the amount of stuff I'm reading now was unthinkable 20 years ago. Okay, so just remember you can develop other styles. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we need to understand that our groups also are similar. They learn differently. Therefore, we must create opportunities for hands-on, for watching, observation, for thinking, theorizing, hypothesizing, generalizing, opportunities for doing. And that's where codes becomes important that not only does it give you an indication that there are different learning styles, but that you can also use this cyclically to create experiences so that at least some of your students are intentionally engaged during your session. Does that make sense? Okay. Ah, uh, is there anything you, you're planning to use? Which one? No. Okay. Uh, this is what we're going to do next time. We don't have time, but we have five minutes. If there's any question you have that about today's session, and I have a last reflective, I'm going to do an online reflection. Uh, before we close, that will take you a few minutes. So, any questions? Any comments? I have a question from Flo. I think when you were talking about Flo, uh, the scene is that so if we're in a classroom and like you just mentioned that if different uh, people would learn, different participants would learn differently, that even applies for the skill, uh, the capacity to act and uh, the opportunity. So how do we create opportunities where most participants can actually achieve flow when the capacities are going to be really different in a lot of settings, especially if you go into a classroom, we have a very, very broad range when it comes to capacities also. So here's another way of looking at it. Um, this, this world that we're involved in, this experiential world, uh, there are three other words that describe what happens. Head, heart, and hand, the 3H theory. Mm -hmm. Create as many opportunities as possible to engage as many of these three elements as possible. So create something for them to be able to do. Create an experience where 
um, some feeling is generated and that could be and just don't get stuck to the idea that it all has to be enjoyable okay let them grow on that's fine and also uh, get them to think about what they are going to do so a classic example would be uh, let's say I'm going to get them to do pottery I'm going to ask them to, so head, heart and hand, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask them to think about what they're going to make. I'm going to get them to draw it out in proportion. And then I'm going to give it to them. And then they're going to do it. And ever so often through that experience, I'm going to check in with them how they're doing. And they will very often uh, express either frustration or great joy. And that gives you an indication that, yes, something was felt. And the thing is about us human beings is this, that uh, we receive through the senses, and we, we, we're going to be talking about it in the next session, that how we feel is how we're going to do something. How we feel is how we're going to learn. Mm -hmm. But it does not mean that you have to make them feel good. A lot of people uh, come back to me and say, but uh, if they're constantly joyful, then will they learn anything? And I say, my only answer is, the point is not joyful. The question is, are they feeling safe? Do they feel like they're not being judged? Do they feel like they're not constantly being measured? Is there an environment where uh, threat is a distance away? Then the pots that they create will be, no matter what they do, will be brilliant because you are not standing in judgment. Then whatever they do will be brilliant because that's the best that they will do on that day. And why can't we accept it? Why do we have this 100% thing that says that a pot must be whatever? You know, each one of us has a different idea of a pot. If I asked you to draw it just now, you'd show me different parts. And if that is true, why can we not accept it from our students? Does that answer your question? Don't fall into the trap about trying to make everybody happy all at the same time. Not possible. Just do as much as you can to get as many as joyful as possible. We've got 50 in this classroom. Do you think everybody is joyful all the time? No, some of you you, you you probably come to that point where you want to kill me and saying, shut up, I want to go. But there's so, so many of you I know also who are saying, wow, this is great, go on. Any other questions? Uh, wish to ask, uh, okay, I, I wish to ask, um, in the sense, like, what do our scores tell us about us? Because uh, this uh, grid that we did just now was about a different type of experiences. And uh, you did say that, you know, you can uh, adapt to a different way of learning. Yeah. And you are limited by whatever you are. Yeah. So uh, who is the judge of it? Like, in the sense, I, uh, what do our scores tell us about uh, thing? You know, which grid? You just use the word accommodator. Yeah. What about the others? Asha, whatever score you've got, you are wonderful. Okay. The only question is, how big a rectangle are you or a square are you? And you mine, want was, mine was big. Good. So that's an indication that... Um, if you want to stay there, you can. Okay? If, you, if you're an accommodator, it's immensely possible that you're finding this online stuff really painful. And it's a struggle. Okay. Yeah? Because yeah. you can't, accommodators can't take too much of this, man. 
Yeah. I mean, you'll notice some of uh, some people here who have got pillows under their, uh, you know, they're probably lying down and they found a really comfortable position to rest. And, they, and a lot of the, a lot of what I'm saying will be lost and that's fine. The only question is, do you want to move from where you are? Because it's possible you go for a conference or a training session, and you're half asleep and you don't, you know, you leave the conference and you feel like you haven't got enough because you were half asleep most of the time or your attention was somewhere else or you were distracted. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, so what you have, you are good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, I think to the left, it was the accommodator, the analyzer, someone who is imaginative. Is that the four uh, parts of the grid? Diverger, assimilator. Yeah, those are the four parts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. While, while I, I don't know if there are other people who have questions, but uh, those of you who, uh, who are ready to do other things, uh, I've sent you a link on your WhatsApp and I will shortly put it into the chat. And it's, um, uh, there are images And the images will give us an indication of how you feel about today's session. Go ahead and uh, write, uh, type in whatever it is that you, uh, how the session was for you today. Uh, also, I request you all to uh, make a, you know, open an account in Padlet. It's free. <coughs> And those of you who have also asked me questions about how did you do this? How did you do that? How can I make my sessions more interactive? These are the tools. Uh, Vishwas? Yeah. Uh, about the images that you just what? Sorry, that, that's my dog. Can you ask him to keep quiet, please? <laughs> no, I was just joking, man. Come on. Yeah, go ahead. The second, I have to calm him down. Yeah, take your time. I'm here. And while other people are doing stuff, somebody who has a question, feel free. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah. So uh, where it says add comment, go ahead and add your comments as to why you chose that. All right. And uh, you had mentioned something about another app that you're going to shift our conversations to. Slack. Yeah. So are you also getting onto that? Yes, please. Because uh, uh, WhatsApp is limiting for the kind of work we're trying to do. Um, so the quest, uh, so uh, we'll give you this week. So by next Saturday, uh, I, I think a link has already been sent, hasn't it? For Slack? No, I have to send it. Oh, okay. Madhavi will be sending you a link. Please. Uh, what are we supposed to do with these images? We just click on it and then it goes? Then there's a question on top. Which image is most? Yeah. So I've identified. Click but where do I write? Comment. Huh? Click on the add comment. And... Uh, Type in why you chose the that. add comment. Where is the add comment? Under the image. Uh, I can't even see. It's too uh, too hazy for me. I mean, I have to really strain my eyes. Uh, okay. Can okay. help her with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Look at the images first. Then you can quint mm -hmm. to look at the add comment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the trouble is it goes off very fast. So by the time I look at the screen, it is gone. No, 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 the screen is there now. Yeah, is it going to remain for a while? Oh, it's, it's, it's on yeah. your WhatsApp. It's on yeah. your WhatsApp. <laughs> no, no, that is even worse. WhatsApp is worse. <laughs> then change your eyes, man. Yeah, yeah, I need to. Too much of online visual, you know, watching. That is the problem. Okay, I'm asked to select the image uh, either. Uh, just uh, 
I'm looking at the ad command and clicking there, but this doesn't so get under, me. Yeah, somebody help her out. MKOs. No, mm -hmm. even I am doing that, but it's not taking as a comment. I'm I'm do, I'm clicking on the comment, but nothing is coming up. Exactly. After you click on add, you can just start writing. If you click on add comment okay. and start writing, it will be there. And then once you're done, there's an arrow that appears. So just click on that arrow. Okay. Unless the stress is forgot or made you forget what you wanted to say. <laughs> Sorry. Vishwas, I have a question. Yes, Aditi. Yeah. So uh, when you were talking about, uh, like, do we plan our learning? Do we make a note, make a list of things? Like, this is what I want to learn from a session. So for example, this session that we're having in this, I feel if I have a list, a list like that, then I feel like I'm biasing my interaction or I'm biasing somewhere what I'm getting out of this interaction, because then I think I would be focusing more on picking things, like trying to check as many things as possible on my list rather done? than being open to Aditi. Taking in whatever is coming. Aditi, Aditi, so what do you feel about that? Aditi, Aditi, Aditi. Yes, sorry. Do you think or do you know? I I think. I think Good. I'm in the think section. Good. Next session, you know what to do. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm still not able to read my comments or do anything. I, I mean, I, I'm typing, but it, I can't see anything. Where's that wonderful son of yours? He's not there. That's the problem. <laughs> <Where's> that? <laughs> <laughs> then rest. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> you can tell me which one you're choosing. I'm, I'm using the spiral. Okay. Hmm. And, and why? Uh, because it's, it's just a whirl of information which is just going in my head right now. Okay. See? Easy. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I had to ask, I mean, but how do I do it? I want to learn that. Hmm. It's not happening. I wonder why. Anybody else uh, having uh, struggling with uh, text not being accepted in the ad comment? Only if you, only if you're not uh, logged in. Only if you're not? Logged in. I just uh, created an account there on Padlet. Okay. And uh, now I can type in. Yeah, but everybody has, yeah, everybody has, the, all the anonymous things are all uh, non -login. All people who did not make account. All anonymous are not people who did not make an account. So you can type even though we use a lot of Padlet in our school. So it's, it's if you do not, uh, I mean, if you can't actually type in, in any comment, you can click on the plus sign here and you can add your comment and just write that image. So, Maybe you can write spiral and add that bit. So that might help you. Okay. That sounds good. The uh, plus sign, which is right at the bottom, the right bottom corner. If you can click on that, you'll be able to add another. Find that zip. The plus at the bottom of the screen, right? Pink Miss, why color. don't you refresh it? Why don't you open it again? Close it and open it again. You'll be able to see the plus sign. It happens okay. sometimes. Um, I have to do it or Vishwas has to do it? No, no. You have to do it for your browser, on your browser. Uh, so how so do I refresh it? Sorry. <laughs> either you click on F5 at the top. Then F5 is, at the top. This is like education, man. The children have to do it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying the laughter. <laughs> Don't worry. Keep playing with it. Just click, man. Uh, Just yeah, I'm doing it, but it's not happening. That's my frustration with the system. Did you, Miss, did you click on F5? Yes. Yeah. Can you I see the, can you scroll down? Huh? Can you scroll down and see the plus sign? Scroll it's, to the, the bottom of the screen. It's frozen. It's not coming down also. The screen has uh, frozen. Uh. So it would eventually, would eventually. Zenobia, or you, you can close it. Places? Close the window and open it again through the link. Uh, what do I close? Uh, which window? The window of the Padlet. So it, uh, the one which says Padlet.com. If you can close it from the top, close that. the tab. Sorry, but I really can't see it. I can only see these uh, okay. rectangular boxes. Zenobia, I got your spiral. Don't worry. Okay. Just keep clicking till then. <laughs> uh, yeah, just just see. shout out to everybody. 
uh, we're done for today. Thank you so much for your reflections. This is a method of doing reflection online. Uh, I have also, also a powerful uh, way of doing it with uh, in person. And uh, we will be talking about it a little more later about uh, what these cards are. If you want these cards, they are available uh, from the store. They are called fun doing cards. So those of you who want the written word and are interested in books, we've got uh, some wonderful books there. Uh, we've tried to make them as inexpensive as possible. So uh, if you feel like you want stuff, go ahead and buy, man. But this is not a commercial break. So I'm done. So you, uh, those of you who need to leave, I kept my word. Bye. Hey, Lars. Bye. Bye. I'm going to Thank dump you, you a lot of material. Precious. Do we get another uh, journal, journal uh, this week? Yes. Definitely. Precious. Uh, you're going to make me write. So oh, yes. you have a question or want to chat, I'm here. Yeah. So are the books uh, hard copy or soft copy? Hard copy. Ah, yeah. Printed. Ah, yeah. I know. We don't have permission from the authors to give you a soft copy. They're not e-books yet. The one, uh, only one of them is anybody with children. Thank you for the session, Vishwash. Vishwas, one of the things that, it's not a question, I don't have a question, but a thought. Um, I think uh, last uh, four or five months have really pushed me in terms of uh, looking at WhatsApp as a learning space, like WhatsApp groups as a learning space. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we discussed today, um, I'm just trying to see how it actually gets applied um, on WhatsApp. Um, also, you know how in so many times in a workshop or a classroom, um, there is a person who, you know, like everyone agrees that this person is like the facilitator, the teacher and all of that. Whereas in a WhatsApp group, uh, we also assume the role of moderators, you know, sometimes depending on how active we are or something. So, so it's just, I think for me, uh, that is an interesting piece as well. But it's also related to what you said last time, that as an educator, as soon as you enter a space, you are influencing the space. Um, so what happens in a space like WhatsApp, where uh, you're not, you know, you, uh, you don't, uh, you sometimes assume that role, but it's not like formally um, agreed upon or understood as a group. Um, and I think it does both things. Sometimes I feel say, sometimes when I want to say something, I feel that um, I'm, I don't know if I should take on the role or sometimes it's the other way around. So yeah, I think I don't, I know that I'm just like blabbering right now, but it's really uh, like what we've discussed today. Uh, I would really want to see how we can apply it in WhatsApp groups. Um, because I feel like, at least for me, there are so many of these WhatsApp groups um, that have become like learning spaces. Um, and so many times, like these groups feel so unsafe as well uh, to ask a question, to share a thought. Sure. Um, so yeah, just like thinking about it. Mean, I know that I stay out of my, <clears throat> my groups. <laughs> sure. Because I noticed uh, a couple of times the moment I said something, conversations would stop. Yeah. But in that case, like if you have groups where, uh, say a group like ours, uh, you are still the facilitator officially, no? So, yeah, we haven't established that. You never said that to us. I told you, you know everything that there is to know. I'm just going to give you a language. Ah. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. 
didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right. 